Well then. <laughs> that was fun. Uh how you doing? Uh we oh boy. I was catch my breath after that. So this is a big night. Uh is a big night in Nick's land for a lot of reasons. We're gonna talk about all of it. Uh let's start with the matter, the immediate matter at hand. The Knicks beat the Toronto Raptors or what is what is left of the Toronto Raptors. No Scotty Barnes tonight, no uh, RJ Barrett tonight, no Emmanuel Quickly tonight, no Yaka Pertle tonight. Uh, I think Chris Boucher was also out, probably forgetting some other relevant player, but they're they were feeling it. Still had some NBA players on the roster. I think you saw that in the first half when they put put forth a commensurate uh, offensive effort, uh, thanks in part to some some quite a little bit lackluster Nick defense. Um, but this one was, I mean, I mean, let, let's just go through it. One forty five to one on one. Most points the Knicks have scored in a regulation basketball game in, since November of 1980. Kenny Albert just said that on the broadcast. Um, they scored, I believe, 80 points in the first half. Most points they've scored in any half this season. Um, and uh, it was it was an onslaught. I mean, they got whatever they wanted offensively against this Raptors team whenever they wanted it for the entire night. They finished this game shooting 57.9% from the field and an even 50% from three second most threes they've ever made in a basketball game um, with 22 second, only to uh, the, that crazy Orlando game uh, from uh, a couple years back. Uh, and I thought for a while that they were going to, that all eight of their main rotation players are going to end up in double digits, but Hart finished with seven points and Mitch finished uh, with eight points. Yeah. Jake Milton coming off the bench to score seven before all was said and done. So like it was an onslaught, it was an onslaught. It's the only word for it. And I thought for the second game in a row coming out against an undermanned, I mean the Brooklyn game, I, I kind of put aside because they were coming off a long road trip. First game back at home after a long road trip is it, it can be tough. Um, but the last two games coming out against bad teams that were already bad and made a lot worse by who was missing, they just they just didn't fuck around. I mean, within a few minutes, you knew the Pistons game was over. Within a few minutes, you knew this game was over. That's what you want to see at this point in the year. And the reason you want to see that is because the Knicks are um, every win, every single game. There are now 10 games left in the season. Every single one of those 10 games will be vital. Um, and uh, we'll go through why that is in the out-of-town scoreboard, which we will do, uh, which I will do after the opening monologue. But spoiler alert, the Knicks are in third place. And the Knicks are in third place because of some um, less than uh, some less than whelming, underwhelming performances uh, by the Cavs and Magic, both of whom lost games they probably should not have lost. We'll talk about those again in a bit. But, um, you know, and the playoff race is going to be interesting. Um, I'm, I have on right now Pacers Bulls. Bulls are up by 13. It's it's going to be it's going to be kind of weird because um, you're you're obviously you want to try to win every game. If you're the Knicks, obviously you want to try to get as high in the standings as possible. You want to get home court. You want to avoid Boston side of the bracket. There's still a slim chance for a second place in the east I don't say it too loud i think it's highly unlikely but so every game matters a lot and and you love the mentality that they came out with tonight regardless of who the opponent was they got one more game coming up on friday against a team that um they should certainly beat we will see if victor Wembanyama plays in that game i actually have not um checked yet tonight uh if he is going but again save that for uh, a little bit later uh and let's talk about the other big story of the night and the biggest story of the night. And that is Mitchell Robinson. Um, it was, it was great to see him back. Um, it was a pleasant surprise when we got, we all got the alert earlier today that, to say that, because when he, when they listed him as out yesterday for the game, you figured, all right, he's not going to play against the Raptors, which I don't think any, any of us, you know, thought he was going to play against the Raptors because it's this version of the Raptors team that you don't really need him for. But, I think, and we've talked about this a lot lately. If you've been listening to the pod, you know, you've heard me say some version of this, which is that the Mitch injury situation, I always have viewed as different from OG and certainly different from Randall. Randall is its own conversation because it's like, you know, again, you made, I've made the Kurt uh, 
analogy to Russian roulette. You only have so many bullets with that shoulder that did not, he did not get surgery. So you want to save those bullets um, with OG. It's kind of this in-between scenario where, you know, whatever. And then, but with Mitch, you figured once he's ready to come back, he's ready to come back. And he was back and oh boy, was he looking good. I thought uh, within the first, within the first, minute i mean really it was like first 15 seconds of the game when he went uh after that loose ball and effectively got an offensive rebound although it was a an untraditional offensive rebound um you know to to batter to to throw it off a raptor's leg like you knew it i thought he was springy i thought i mean they were trying to throw him lobs he he converted a couple of them uh it was everything you could have possibly hoped to see from mitch uh and he's gonna be on a minutes limit Fred Katz essentially came on the pod uh, and and said that as much today or yesterday. Uh, And so it looks like we're going to be getting a three-headed center monster for the foreseeable future because Hardenstein, whether it's a 30, 26 minute limit, 28 minute limit, whatever it is, you know, Mitch, I don't know what his minutes limit is going to be. The Knicks have not publicly said what his minutes limit is going to be. He played 12 minutes tonight. I don't know. Is that because that's the most he could play? Or it's because if they were involved in this sort of game, they didn't need to push him. Either way, it's great because we have the best third string center in the league. We have the best fourth string center in the league, and Jericho Sims and, and certainly or Precious Achua and, and Jericho Sims. So it was great to see Mitch back tonight, looking like himself. Um, and then, I mean, look, we well, we could praise any number of players tonight. Like uh, I said, after the Pistons game, Jalen Brunson had the quietest twenty eight point game of his of his. Uh, Nick career. Well, tonight he had the tw- quietest 26 point game of his Nick's career. Although again, just like that Pistons game in the beginning of the third quarter at the moment in this game where the Knicks were like, all right, we're going to, we're going to officially put this one to bed where they went up by, I think the first time they went up by 20 middle of the second quarter. Um, Yeah, it was, he scored eight. Who, who was it scoring eight straight points and just tough bucket after tough bucket to put them up 60 to 39 Jalen Brunson. So great game from Brunson. Isaiah Hardenstein doing all the Isaiah Hardenstein things. You love to see that. Uh, Josh Hart didn't need to do a whole lot tonight. Still ended up with 10 assists, six rebounds, seven points. You love all that. Um, DiVincenzo not two away from the three-point record. Figure he'll get that in San Antonio, which will be a really, a really cool thing. Um, and uh, Bogey. How about that? Bogey finding finding the, 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 the fountain of youth? I don't know what that was. Uh, he, he Look, he... He was getting it. He's getting good looks, solid. Um, and it was great to see signs of life. Let's end with Precious and Deuce. So I, I brought up Precious a little bit already, but I want to shout him out specifically because I think with Mitch back, you know, three headed center monster aside, um, you figure the guy that's going to take the biggest brunt or feel the biggest, the brunt of that is, is precious to Chua. Um, because, you know, he, there's only going to be a couple minutes at the backup center. And then, you know, obviously when OJ and OB comes out, then it gets really interesting. As of now, it played 27 minutes because he's still playing uh, the backup four, which by the way, I thought was the right decision. I thought it was the right decision for, and it was a decision that I think was made easier by the fact that Alec Burks was a no go tonight. My two cents, even when Alec Burks is back playing and back healthy, I would rather see certainly Precious Achua as the eighth man um, in the in the rotation um, as opposed. And again, we're talking before OG comes back uh, than Alec Burks. Um, I, I don't know if what I said just made sense. Yeah, well, it, it, even if Alec Burks, yeah, well, even when Alec Burks is back healthy enough to play, I'd still rather see Precious as the eighth man. If you want to go nine. And you want to play Burks and and Precious with the backup unit? That's fine. I don't really care. But Precious, like, he just continues to earn his time. And you saw it tonight with 13 rebounds. He had that, my lord, that was that the dunk of the year for a Nick? I think that might have been the dunk of the year for the Nick. If there's a better one, somebody remind me of it. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Maybe actually, you know, Randall. I think Randall had a big dunk. I I, I forget if it was this year or last year. We had a big dunk at some point in the last like, couple of years. But that's the only other one that comes to mind. Um, this was a big one. Um, obviously came out at the end of the blow a blowout, but it was still serious. But I, I just, you know, and it was at those apropos of him coming back to Toronto tonight, a place where I'm sure 
he felt like I would imagine he felt like he never got a fair shake because just as he was really starting to play well and really kind of come into his own and, 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 and make a good contribution to a decent team, they go out and trade a uh, first round pick or whatever it was. I forget who, whether there was two first round picks uh, for Yaka Pirtle. And it's like, okay, so they could go pay Yaka Pirtle $20 million a year. How, how's that working out anyway? And tonight, coming back to Toronto, but on the same night that Mitchell Robinson comes back to kind of push him out of his, out of his rotation spot somewhat, um, for him to come in and just bring so much energy. And I thought, again, him and Robinson off the bench together, I thought it was fine. Obviously, it's going to be a lot easier against a team that can't play any defense. Much bigger test will come when they face a team that can um, guard them, uh, uh, just period, guard them. Uh, but, like, you wonder. Can the combination of those two guys in the interim until OG comes back and then obviously until Randall comes back, can they keep you honest on the offensive end, whether it's purely through offensive rebounding, whether it's I mean through whatever, a lot of screen setting and, and a lot of movement, which the team has been doing a lot of lately. Um, we'll see. But it was great to see him have a great night. And then, of course, we're going to end with Deuce McBride. So Deuce McBride. <laughs> I went. I went back and looked because I was. I, I, for a while, it looked like Deuce, there was not going to be a Nick who was going to play forty minutes tonight. And I was like, "Man, when's the last time that's happened?" Turns out, no Nick played forty minutes in the Kings game, which I was shocked when I saw that. But yeah, Josh Hart was the the most in that game with thirty eight and change. So when I was like, "Oh man, when's the last time a Nick hasn't played forty in a game?" But it's immaterial because guess who played forty minutes tonight? Deuce with pride. Um. 29 points, which I think is either a career high or he tied his career high, certainly set a new career high by by three threes with nine three pointers, nine of 14 from deep. Watching him put them up, put those threes up in the first quarter and tie the franchise record, which had been uh, previously held um, or he joins, I should say, John Starks and Quentin Richardson with six threes in a quarter. I mean, and all the minutes he plays and the defensive assignments he takes every night and just like the dude never quits. It is a testament to everything that he is about. And I, I want to be very clear. I do not mean this to cast dispersions on anybody that has been traded away that this team drafted because all those guys were valuable components and showed a lot of dog, a lot of dog over the years that they were here. But I don't, I don't think it's a complete and total coincidence that the last man standing of the quote unquote like young crop of players that they that they drafted over those couple of years. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's Deuce um, because he just goes about his business every freaking minute um, that he's on the court and, and he's off the court and with his practice habits. You, you've heard t uh, Tibbs talk about that recently, that nobody other than maybe Jalen gets up more shots in the gym. And hey, it's showing off. It's showing right now with 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 what they with what he's doing which is quite frankly preposterous looking at his three point percentage and his just overall efficiency his first two years in the league to go from that to this where he's like i mean and th these are not these are not wide open catch and shoot threes like there are hands in his face on a lot of these and there are some pull ups sprinkled in there and it's like i mean this is this is serious shit. And like, you know, I'll give my myself a, a, a shameless plug here in the Knicks Film School newsletter earlier today. I did a, a top five ranking of most best value contracts in the league. I, I set the limit at the full mid level and only contracts that extended until at least next year. So like Hardenstein was ineligible because he's expiring. And I I ranked Deuce third. I ranked even Genzo first. Um, I rank Alex Caruso second, even though he's expiring next year. And I rank Deuce as the third most valuable, um, again, sub full mid-level contract in the league. Because you got this guy for $13 million over the next three years after this one. And his defense certainly keeps him on the floor. And if he's going to shoot it like this and he's the playmaking is coming around bit by bit by bit by bit. Um, I mean, my God. Uh, I've had a lot of shitty tweets over the years. I think number one with a bullet might be when the, when the day they signed Shake Milton. I was like, ah, the Knicks got a real backup point guard. I didn't age well. And you know what? I, I was 
I was in a rush to judge this kid because what we saw from him, even though he was hitting shots when he first got back into the rotation after the trade in January, I was like, yeah, it's really nice, but he's not he's still not playing like a point guard. He's still more, much more of a wing. And I think what you've seen as he's gotten more and more time, he's getting more comfortable with the ball in his hands. And he's getting more comfortable, you know, initiating the offense. He doesn't have to do it a lot, especially now he's playing a lot with Brunson. But when he does have to do it, it's like not a complete disaster. It's not taking them 15, you know, whatever seconds to get into their sets. And and uh, look, the play, the real test will come during the playoffs. And I'm assuming he's going to get the non-Brunson minutes. Is he going to be the, the one initiating the offense in those on those possessions? That's going to be the test. That's going to be the test. Um, and we'll see what happens. But fantastic night for him. Fantastic night for the Knicks. Um, and fantastic night for Mitchell Robinson. Fantastic night all across the board. And on that note, um, I guess we should go. Uh, what are we doing first here, Andrew Claudio? Um, well, first things first, shout out to the New York Knicks for giving us a fun basketball game to watch tonight. And as you already brought to the world, uh, we are going to talk about the road to recovery, which began with Mitchell Robinson yeah. returning to the rotation tonight. Uh, shout out to the uh, Mitchell Robinson and he. Headlines are Road to Recovery with the fine folks over at Unified Healing. Uh, go to unified unifiedhealing.com to learn more and to find a center near you. Uh, who would you like to talk about first? Alec Burks didn't play tonight. Yeah, so let's start there. Burks is dealing with uh, a shoulder. I'm going to sound like uh, Jim Nance. He's got, Burks, Burks is out with a shoulder. Um, and... I don't know the severity of it. Apparently it was, you know, bothering him for a while, but um, I think the best question is like, are are we going to see Alec Burks play another rotation minute for this team? Uh, And I don't really know what the answer to that question is, Uh, especially, you know, if he's out for longer than OG is out, which uh, leads us to the next guy that we should talk about. OG and an OB, you know, I find it very interesting that for I don't know how many press conferences it is in a row now. Tom Thibodeau has gotten up there and is like, he's doing a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Well, okay. Like what, what, what defines a little bit better? Is he like, you know, he's shooting around. We know that. Um, And he keeps using that same verbiage. Let the elbow, let, let it calm down a little bit more. I, what? are you genuinely worried? No, I'm not genuinely worried because I think they're looking at the fucking team that they got going out there every night and kicking the shit out of all these teams. But I will say, you know, look, Jeremy made a good point on the pod. If OG sits out the Thunder game, like like they'll need him, then it the concern level goes up a little bit. That's a Thunder game when they play a real basketball team. Yes. I'm not. I haven't even cross the bridge to worry yet because okay. i gotta be honest i was actually encouraged he was in he's traveling with the team sure like the fact that the the injury management like he's warming up with the team he's going on road trips he made the trip to toronto he's probably going to san antonio i would i'm expecting him to be suddenly able to play on sunday I, and then that's when i would be like oh no he's not playing against the thunder i just keep going back to the conversation i had with fred on the pod that dropped yesterday, which when I, when I asked Fred, I'm like this, this tug of war, I don't think it's a tug, tug of war, but you know, this kind of push and pull competing interests between like you have a coach and a, and a locker room full of players that it's like, Hey man, if we could go, we're going to go, we're going to go hundred percent. We're going to go full, full tilt the whole thing versus an organization that obviously is trying to keep its players healthy, but also, and when Fred was like, I don't think they give a shit who they play. And I believe that. I don't think the Knicks care who they play. But it's like, you know, those two things should not make sense in the same world, but they they do clearly. Like, so I I don't I don't know. I think um, a lot of organizations do this, and we're just not used to it. And yeah, no, for, uh, yeah, ab- absolutely, absolutely, they do. Um, it's just like clearly, it's not like we are. They are going from top to bottom gung-ho like we need to pull out every stop to get the three seed or whatever it is it's like we're gonna give it our all with the guys that we feel are ready to play but the but the whether we feel our guys should give it a go tonight if they're hurt is a complete and separate total conversation which i you know you think them not playing in an ob 
means they're not going all out to get the three seed. Deuce played 40 minutes tonight. They had three guys played yes, 40 minutes that's, against Detroit on Monday. You're making my point. We're trying to draw this imaginary line between like, well, they're clearly going all out for it, but like, I, okay, I'll put it this way. If tomorrow was, if tonight was game five of a playoff game, would I know we have played? I, have, I yes. think you would have. So like, you that's, have. you get what I'm saying here? I do. I just, I think that line you're talking about, it's like, it like goes around Ananobi because he's like a get right guy. Like you want to make sure he gets right. Like absolutely. Totally. Mitch needs reps like Hartenstein. There's a minute's limit. Ananobi, the ceiling of this team goes far beyond a two seed, you know? So yes. Yes. that's why I think they're, they're going to proceed with caution with him, which is why Sunday will be the first time well, I'd be worried. I, they won by 45 points tonight without him. Like yeah. they probably could have sat Brunson tonight and won. They probably could have had you play in point guard and won by five. Like, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, more team than freedom, Liberty or whatever his name was. Okay. Uh, let's finish up uh, Julius Randall. Um, you know, no, no new news. So he gets back when he gets back. Yeah. That's at that point. Now, and actually, to... sorry. One, one last thing. I know mm-hmm. it's not a Nick. Um, but uh, since we're talking about the road to recovery, news that Joel Embiid uh, is going to be back potentially, according to Woj, for the last handful of games of the season. Uh, I'm not sure that's relevant in terms of like the Sixers' pursuit of the Knicks. The Sixers lost again tonight to the uh, Los Angeles Clippers in a, a game that I I imagine it was a pretty thrilling game, but I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to watch it. Oh, they but, overturned it. What? Oh, that's wild. So the game you're referring to, the the people probably will have already seen this um, when they're listening to this later. But uh, back and forth the entire final minute, four lead changes. Yeah. Um, Kawhi Leonard down two, gets an and one, makes the layup. Buddy Heald comes back, hits a three. Sixers up two. Um, Kawhi Leonard, oh, wow, he hit two and ones again with an and one and a layup. And then coming back down the other end, Tyrese Maxey was fouled and they reviewed and they overturned it. it. They overturned it, okay. which led to it looks well, like a a jump ball so, and the Clippers game possession game over. So my, wow. my point is I do not think the clip the the Sixers are a threat to catch the Knicks, but guess who the Sixers play in the penultimate game of the season, the Orlando Magic. And we'll mm. see if the Magic are still uh and Magic and Knicks are in a race, which this is a good transition uh, opportunity too. The Out of Town Scores, presented by the fine folks over at T-Squared Social, the new home for Knicks Film School watch parties. Um, I've got a thing to read about them in just a little bit, but uh, the main thing you need to know is that if you go there and tell them Knicks Film School sent you, you get a free draft beer on them. So you visit t-squared.social.com, t-squared to learn more. Uh, again, the new home for Knicks Film School watch parties. Um, you read the out of town scores. I'm going to get the literature I have to read in a second. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Mm-hmm. So, um, we will go through them, uh, in order of relevance. The Cavaliers, uh, lost to the, uh, do, 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 do. pull it up right here. Cavaliers lost to the Hornets in a game that, uh, Charlotte trailed by, uh, quite a few points in the, uh, first half, definitely. And then I, I was like watching it, then I wasn't watching it because they were they you know they were down by a lot. And uh, yeah, the the Cavs led by 14 points in this game. Hornets came all the way back, ended up winning, make, made some big plays in the final minute. Brandon Miller hit a game clinching three, so Cavs beat the Hornets. Um, the uh, fighting, quite literally, uh, Golden State Warriors after Draymond after they were without uh, Kuminga and Draymond. I uh, didn't feel like playing basketball tonight, as as DJ Zulo pointed out on Twitter. Got it, got himself ejected in like the first four minutes of the game. They still beat the Orlando Magic in a barn burner, one hundred one to ninety three. Um, and we, I mentioned the Sixers lost to the Clippers, and for good measure, uh, I can I can I report this? Can I can I give some fresh reporting? Uh, the Bulls are currently up one thirteen to eighty nine on the Indiana Pacers. Whoa, oh, yes. whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. You got to read their name correctly. The Indiana Pacers. They're your Indiana They're Pacers. They're my Indiana Pacers. My Indiana go. Pacers. Um, yeah, oh, wait. I can't add. I was like, are they up 14? No, they're up by 24 points. Yeah, the Bulls yeah. Are, are beating the Indiana Pacers tonight. So 
That game will go final shortly. So, add it all up, and here's where we're at. The Knicks are two games back of the Bucks, but they don't have the tiebreaker. I still don't really think that's a realistic thing. Half a game up on the Cavs, um, and they do have the tiebreaker against Cleveland. That is notable. Um, and they have one more game that they get to play instead of the Cavs, which I think in this instance is a is a positive, especially with the Cavs going on a tough road trip. Although we should have mentioned in the road to recovery, Donovan Mitchell likely coming back in their next game. Uh, Orlando is now two games back of the Knicks um, at 42 and 30. The Pacers are about to go a full four games back of the Knicks. I think that might be too much to overcome. I I've I I've been not afraid of the Pacers. So even with the tie, the tie, it's the tiebreaker. Uh, yeah, it's they the can't breaker. win more games than like they don't go on large winning streaks. They no, they don't impress you against like a good team, and then they get blown out by the Bulls. Like you know, yeah. Um, no, that's fair. So pay, so the Knicks. Pro- I mean, effectively, the Knicks probably clinched the top five seed tonight. Um, and then, uh, and then that's it. And the, and the heater, oh my God, the Knicks are ahead of the heat by five games. Can I give you the mo- most fascinating thing about the East playoff picture at the moment? So top eight seeds, right? One through eight, the, from the Celtics down to the Sixers after that Pacers score goes finals, the Knicks will be the only team on a current winning streak of at least one. <laughs> Everybody else will have at least one loss in a row. That's pretty good. Yes. A lot of good things. Good. Knicks are getting healthy at the right moment. A lot of teams are dragging themselves to the finish line. Yeah. So, um, man, a uh, dream scenario for me personally would be Orlando somehow fall into six, but I don't, uh, I don't know if that, if that's going to happen, but we'll see. Knicks in five either way. Um, so I want to let people know about the fine folks over at T squared social. First of all, they want you to know that you can watch, uh, the Knicks live at the garden or the next best place T squared social Manhattan's newest entertainment and dining experience. Uh, they also, uh, you can watch all out of town, out of market games. So that could be the games that we all just mentioned that you could have been at T squared social watching all of the games, uh, the, the end of the Sixer game, the very fun uh, Hornets against the Cavs game, the uh, Warriors against the uh, Orlando Magic. All these games Ro- that went down to the wire. Rockets Thunder is coming down to the wire right now. Oh, you could be at T squared right now watching that. They have lead pass. Doing watching and- us. Go, go, watch, go. No, no, no. Watch us. Watch us. Watch us. At least have it up on your phone and don't go anywhere, please. Please don't listen to John. Like I've been that sense. Please just listen. Watch us. Stay here. We'll tell you the scores. That's why we're doing this segment. Uh, they also, uh, we, we've we shown pictures. They have golf simulators, duck pin bowling, uh, darts, cornhole. They have, they have plenty of things that they, they do that aren't just sitting there having dinner and watching the game. And they're starting some Friday night sports leagues starting April 12th. These are all the leagues I just mentioned with all skill levels. Uh, so join with your friends or join solo to make new ones. Uh, the deadline to sign up is April 3rd. So use code KFS10 to get 10% off when you sign up. That's KFS10. Uh, you get something to do on a Friday night. What is that, like flag football playing. or something? Huh? You said you're Friday not night sports anything. leagues. Right. Did you not hear anything I said about duck pin bowling or? Oh, the, okay. So it's like things in the thing, in, yes, the, in the location. In the thing. Oh, okay. Yes. So maybe they're like sponsored a flag football team. I don't know. No, literally things you can do at T-Squared Social. They're starting Friday night leagues. That's very so, cool. If you want to go there and join one of their Friday night leagues, maybe it's something we could consider during the off season, like a Friday night golf simulator league. Um, I mean, I don't know about me, but if I, if I was a young single man, I'd be definitely going there. I mean, you probably meet some some nice, uh, nice, uh, you know, f- uh, members of the fair sex going seeing who's doing some duck pin bowling on a Friday yes. night. Absolutely. Yeah. And so whatever your reason to sign up, uh, use KFS 10 to get 10% off when you sign up and kick off your kick off your kick off your weekend with some friendly competition and catching all the action from your favorite team because they have a TV in every simulator. So, again, T squared social at 7 East 42nd Street, just a hop, skip and a jump from Grand Central. Uh, shout out to the fine folks at T squared social, the new place for Nick's film school watch parties. And on that note, let us get to Super Chats. 
All right. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'm going to start getting the monologues down uh, a few minutes uh, less, and uh, we'll we'll get to Super Chats a little bit quicker. Why? Because, you know, I don't want to keep people waiting. We're, we're, we're keeping them waiting right now. Let's get to it. Come on. We can do this. I think people are along for the show. They're enjoying said show that they tuned in for. I appreciate the Super Chats and the contributions, but they know this is part of the deal. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And now we get to the Super Chats after John's very well said monologue and the fine sponsors that paid the bills for tonight. <laughs> you got to love Andrew. Um, Jesse M starts us off. So at what point does this deuce thing become real? That's kind of where I'm at. That's kind of where I'm at. Um, it's when you when you put it like that. It, it makes it I, I'm speaking for myself because I put it. I'm the same way. I'm in the same boat. It, it, it It's almost like you're putting him putting him down. You're belittling him like. But it's not because we this this player was so offensively limited. And for two years, and I know his percentages were what they were for the basically the entire season. Even they go through a slump earlier in the year, but there is something different about the confidence that he is shooting it with now. Like he put up, I mean, how many threes did he, is he putting up like over the, I'll pull it up, but like he it's, this is wild. Like, did we ever think that Deuce of pride in any, in any scenario would put up 14 threes in a game? I mean, come on. The, he put up whatever he put up seven in the first quarter. Like that's, that's a guy who's like, he's he he's secure in his role. He's doing exactly what the coach is telling him to do. I guarantee you, no one wants him to fire away more than Tibbs. Probably been yelling at him to do it for since the day he was drafted. Um, I, I mean, I think it's real. What's I don't know. I don't know what else do we need to see. I mean, we got to see it in the playoffs. So, I guess after we see it in the playoffs, then it becomes like really real. But that's about it. Busy, what's going on, Busy? Not gonna lie, I'm loving how this offense looks. I see what's unsaid there, sir. The ball is almost never sticking off ball movement. Oh, he's saying the quiet part off loud, out loud. Uh, and even weak side screens. It's almost like everyone's processing speed is up to date. If you know, you know. Uh, I I thought you were going to be a little more subtle about it, Busy. So much for that. Look, it. I, we all know what Busy's talking about, and and, and I'm not going to kill him for it because they don't. I mean, we could. It's, we're allowed to say that that the offense not often look like this with with Julius. Okay, we could say that at the same time, and this is the big butt, a huge butt. We had a uh, we had a hot dick tonight. Now it's a big butt. Um, this team that they played tonight the Pistons team that they played the other night, like a lot of these games that they've been playing with this version of the team, meaning without Julius, these are not, these are not NBA defenses, you know? So you could, you could do this stuff and it looks great. looks pretty. You try to do this against, I mean, I'm not going to say any playoff team, but the better, Playoff teams, the types of teams. Now, look, are you going to tell me, like, well, who might they face in the playoffs? Can you do this stuff against the Pacers? Probably. Can you do this stuff against the bus, the Bucks? Probably. Um, I will I will die on this hill for as much as I agree with you in spirit. Busy. I love the way it looks. I, I'm just, I mean, I'm I'm kidding with you. I love the way it looks. It's how could anyone not love the way this offense looks? They're going to need they're going to need Julius. Like they're gonna need his gravity. Um, now is the, the, let me. I'll push back on my own pushback, and I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say. I want to see how much at slash how willing Julius Randle is when he comes back to kind of incorporate some of this stuff into his game because I think he can, and two. They no longer maybe need to rely as much on Julius's way of playing. Will they need to rely on it sometimes? Absolutely. 
But there may be other times where like this style of play is with with this personnel and they're missing OG. And that's another big piece of it, because right now they put up 145 points on this. Again, I know it's not an NBA team that they played tonight, but they did it with Josh Hart there when that's OG there spacing the floor and being able to to do some things. um, Then it gets even a higher level. So, look, you want a lot of different options, more options, the better. I trust the head coach to try to balance all that out. Um, reasonable minds may differ, uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, it's but to your point, busy. It's it's great to watch. It's great to see. Thanks, Biz. Kevin Danishevsky, what's going on, sir? Everything I said about Quentin Grimes, I mean Quentin Grimes, I mean about Deuce. This is getting out of hand. It's great to see Mitch back. Dominant in limited time. Forty-eight minutes of great center play is coming. I think we got it right now. Like, I don't, I, I think Precious brings some real interesting stuff to the table. I love him just as, like, an energy guy, you know, for if it ends up being five to ten minutes a game. I'll tell you right now, I'm perfectly fine with Precious Achua playing six, seven, eight minutes a game off the bench in a playoff game. Totally. At, at the center spot, at the center position. Um. As for Deuce, I mean, again, I, I've run out of things to say. I wrote two newsletters effectively on him this week, inspired by him this week. They, like, I don't, I, I spent a lot of time going through NBA player salaries for the for the piece that I wrote today, and it is wild how many people have signed contracts in, like, the last 18 months maybe 19 months or whatever, going back to July of 2022. So it's probably whatever, 20 months. Going back to that, the pre, the summer before last. For like, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, $12 million annually, all in that range, who have found themselves out of rotations entirely, you know, um, at times. And he's making four point three million dollars a year over the next three seasons. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, just you don't really see bargains like this happen anymore. And the Knicks got themselves one. Thanks, Kev. Sam Garcia, we're coming for that two seed, John. I, I look, why you got to make me pour cold water in the in the first hour of the show? Here, here's my here, here's where I'm at with the with the two seed. Okay, first of all, I don't really care. If they get to the three seed and they win whoever they're going to, they, they beat whoever the, I'll say even one more thing. This is going to sound insane, but I'll say it anyway. Are we sure we want the two seed with the news today that Joel Embiid is coming back for the end of the regular season? Are we sure we want to dance with the guy who was going to steamroll his way towards a second consecutive MVP award? Are you sure you want to see that guy in the first round? Who you might see. The alternative is to see Miami, which at this point, I don't know what to think of Miami. They'll always be the boogeyman to some. I think deep down inside, they'll probably always be the boogeyman to me. I don't know, man. I I, I kind of, I'm, I'm fine at the three spot. That's the first thing. The second thing, the fact that Milwaukee owns the tiebreaker, I know two games back doesn't sound like a lot. Go sit down and do the math. Go sit down and do the math and actually literally write down how many, what each team's record would need to be for the Knicks to get ahead of the Bucs. And I know there is a game left between the two teams. You need to, you have, you have to make up two more games in addition to that game because of the tiebreaker. And the Bucs have, by my count, three, no doubt about it, wins on their schedule. They also play the Hawks, which we'll see. Um, and like they're not gonna, they're probably not gonna lose like every other game. So you know, and the Knicks are not gonna win every other game. So I, I, I don't see it happening. But not the worst thing in the world. Busy with another one. Honest, innocent question. Water under the bridge because he isn't on the team anymore. But if Deuce could start next to Brunson, why couldn't Emmanuel quickly? I want to hear your take. Um, I think he's. I think that's a loaded question, Busy. And I know we got a town hall coming up next week, which I'm, if it's all right with you, I'd like to get into a little bit more then. 
in short, I'll try to make this as short as possible. I think there was never a need. No, that's not the right way to phrase it. Okay, I'll just say the thing. Uh, Politics. Politics played a role, I think, in why Emmanuel quickly never started next to Jalen Brunson. Because that would have meant the guy who you would put on the bench would have been R.J. Barrett. And I don't think they were this organization was ever prepared to have R.J. Barrett come off the bench. I think that that is a big part of it. Um, also, the head coach likes his size, as we know, which gets to the the other part of my answer, which is that I think they are. They are doing it right now out of necessity because of who they have and who they don't have. And I think he. Tibbs is looking at this and it's like, all right, well, I if I if I play Precious, who's the other reasonable option, because that's the other option he went to, I am I have no spacing. Because I have a traditional five, I have a four who nobody's gonna guard, I have a three who nobody's gonna guard, because he got hard too. So if the if the 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 gap, the spacing gap, the spacing gap between Precious and starting Deuce is big enough that I think Tibbs is willing to punt on the size, whereas I don't think there was any such gap in his mind, at least, between what the starting lineup with quickly would have been and like the whatever the, the starting lineup they effectively went to, in addition to the politics part of it. The other part of it I think I, I will add to is I think he liked having quickly come off the bench because I think he liked the spark. And I think the like he liked the fact that, hey, if this is one of those games where quickly really had it going, I could still play him 30 minutes and I could still close the game with him, which he, we did see a lot on occasion. All of this is beating around the very simple fact that like quickly could have absolutely started next to Brunson and it absolutely could have worked. I just don't think they ever had the reason to do it or the reasons to do it, or there were enough reasons not to do it, I guess is maybe the better way of putting it. Um, and I think things are, are kind of, the, the circumstances have changed on, on numerous fronts now. Um, or, Hey, maybe, maybe all of what I just said is poppycock and it comes down to the head coach finding religion. I don't, that could be it too. Um, but I think, I don't think if I missed anything, yeah, you know, one other thing I'll say. One other thing. As an overall defender, you might argue quickly is better than Deuce. He's not better at the point of attack. And we saw Deuce, we saw uh, in the pre three previous games, or four previous games, whatever it was, go guard five previous games. Go guard Steph Curry. Go guard um, Jamal Murray. Go guard Cam Thomas. I mean, the Pistons didn't really have anybody for him to guard, and neither did the Raptors. But, like, whoever the most threatening guard, doesn't matter if there are one or two on the opposing team, you now, by starting Deuce, you have a guy. It's like, okay, go shut him down. You couldn't do that quickly. That wasn't quickly. That wasn't quickly's MO, you know? So that, I think, is another reason. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's a satisfactory answer, Busy. But I see where you're coming from, and it's like, yeah, you make a very valid point. That's for sure. Bernard Richardson, what's going on, Bernard? 13. 13. Wire-to-wire -wire wins on the season, most in the NBA, significant or not. It's absolutely significant. It's significant because to it shows, to me, wire-to-wire -wire victory shows so many things. They show you come out with the right mentality. They show you do not play down to a shitty opponent. They show you do not fuck around and let bad teams or any or just teams because we they've done it against good teams too. You don't let teams back in the game once you have your you keep your foot on their neck. To me, wire to wire victory show all of those things. Um, it shows you know how to play with the lead, which is important during the playoffs. Uh. Like, my lord, think about what if you if we will go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now and think back to 
the the post we hear season. We have to agree on a name for that season. I feel bad calling it the Kemba season, but that that like that's what the first thing that is that comes to my mind. Maybe we could just call it the Kemba Fournier season. Um, whatever. The the bad the bad year. If there's one thing that for me will always define that season is that that team, no matter how big their lead was, they couldn't hold it. Like no t- no opponent was ever out of a game. And the fact that they have turned it around as a franchise so much in a two year span is a testament to, I mean, it's a testament to Jalen Brunson, I think first and foremost, but just, I think they've continued to get the right sorts of players in here who that shit is not going to happen on their watch. Thanks, Bernard. Sam Garcia with another one now 40 and three when leading by 10 plus points in the game. So similar to Bernard's point. Yeah, absolutely. They, they don't screw around and, and more uh, to that, point of not screwing around they have two more games to go against the teams in this group but the worst eight teams in the standings so the bottom five in the east and uh the bottom three in the west i believe it's now they are 22 and 0 against those eight teams they have games against san antonio remaining tomorrow and then they have one more game against brooklyn i haven't gone through uh every team's record i mean i could probably just start with boston maybe boston has done it like beaten all of those crappy teams i can't imagine that there's another team in the league that has that has done that beaten literally every team that they are supposed to beat but um the Knicks seem to thanks sam Drew and on what's going on Drew and on how you doing my friend it's great to uh it's great to see you I know it's the depleted Raptors, and I know it's only one game, but the league should be on watch. Adding 48 minutes of rim protection to OG's wing defense is going to be major trouble. Hashtag fire tips. Um, yeah, they're a bear. I don't think they played any serious defense tonight. You know what the most serious defense I saw? The most serious defense I saw the play tonight was uh, – in the the when the scrubs came in midway through the fourth quarter before that they were like they were doing enough like they were but like you know tibbs wasn't happy with the freaking defense tonight but yeah no when they're locked in with this per, with the personnel that they're gonna have forget about it and i didn't need this game to to tell me that i didn't need this game to tell me that all right we got two from jay right here first one finals contenders hold the cold water macri I'll I'll read your next one. Mitch's D leads the offense. Hashtag underrated fact. Um, Mitch's defense leads the offense. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think at any any time you get a splash play, it leads to offense. Because whether it's a steal or a block, you know, it your your offensive players should be running the other direction. I think they did a a fantastic job of that tonight. But I think you. I agree with you. Mitch defense, Mitch's defense does lead to offense, but I think you could say the same thing about Hardenstein or Ananobi or, you know, Josh Hart or, or Deuce McBride. You know, they have, they have a lot of guys now who the defense leads to offense. Um, they still don't gamble a ton, you know, and which is why the steel numbers, the steel numbers have gotten higher this year, but the steel numbers are never going to be too high tonight. Well, tonight the Raptors had 18 turnovers, so that's actually quite a, quite a lot. But again, the Knicks only had seven steals, you know, so they don't um, th- those numbers are never going to be high. But I agree with you. They have a lot of guys capable of turning defense into offense for sure. And it, oh, sorry, the first comment in terms of are they finals contenders? Yeah, of course, they're finals contenders. Like. I don't think I don't think Boston wants to face them healthy. Um, Sam L with a, with a super chat here. Wonder what Monty Williams take on the next three point barrage tonight is we look ready to make, uh, a deep run consistently greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. That's why, I mean, that was kind of what I was getting ready to say is I don't, that's why I don't think Boston is necessarily going to be excited to play the Knicks. And I just, I'm looking up right now the, 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 um, and I should have remembered it cause it was a memorable game. The Celtics lost the game this year to the Charlotte Hornets. So, uh, yeah, the Knicks might be the only team in the league who have, quote-unquote, um, beaten all of the teams that they were supposed to beat. Um, you know, those those bottom eight teams. 
Um, Monty Williams. I, can I say something? Uh, I'll, I'll be kind. Look, Monty's had a, a tough season. I did not realize the backstory to his getting hired and not until uh, they said it on the uh, the Hoop Collective podcast this week, which apparently they went to him with whatever an offer was, a very generous offer. And he's like, yeah, I don't want to coach this year. And then they went back with the Rays to make him the highest paid coach in NBA history. And he's like, well, I guess I have to say yes. So it's like, you know, the guy probably should never coach to begin with this year if, you're, if, if your heart's not fully in it. And then, you know, it's not a great roster and, and the whole thing. So, like, I get it. He's a frustrated man. He's a proud man. He should, like, I, I he should be mad. That he went in front of a microphone and seriously implied that the, that the Knicks, like, were, like, what they were doing was, was somehow wrong in terms of trying to get to Vincenzo the record. And I want to particularly shout out DJ Zulo, who had a fantastic thread today um, for Knicks Film School, or yesterday, excuse me, yesterday for Knicks Film School, in which he clipped every single one of Dante DiVincenzo's three-pointers against the Detroit Pistons. And you know what the case was? For the first nine of them, the defense was, was at best poor or lacking, and at worst, abhorrent doesn't even describe. So, sorry, Monty. Those are your players that you've coached up. You've had 70 games to coach those guys up. And they are making these errors in, like, some of that shit was basic coverage. Like, guys, you know, darting out to Josh Hart to leave Dante DiVincenzo open. Like, what are you doing? You know, how many times does Jaden Ivey... Um, defend a three pointer with his hand down below his waist, not in not in proper position. Like it's Monty Williams' job to coach these guys up, and he has failed to do that. So it is Monty Williams' failure directly leading to the first nine, at least, of those DiVincenzo threes. And yes, after they got nine, did he hunt the tenth and hunt the eleventh? Sure, but you needed to get the first nine. And the first nine, I, look, Steven Chen was incredibly talented, and that's why he, he got the record. But, like, the Pistons defense had a lot to do with that. So, sorry, Monty. Go look in the fucking mirror. With all due respect. Thank you, Sam. I don't think you could tell someone to look in the fucking mirror and then say, with all due respect. Probably not. Yeah. That was, like, extremely disrespectful. I love it that you were taking it to a coach. But... I, I don't think that was very respectful. With which all I love. due respect. So it, whatever respect is due. It is you not up to me. You say take that for data or something. Like you you could have ended it on the look in the fucking mirror and then the mic would have just dropped right there. <laughs> he hates me so much. <laughs> With all due respect. <laughs> John, you're a fucking asshole. With all due respect. CC Kirby. What's going on, CC Kirby? Don't underestimate how much it means psychologically for a guy like Bogey to see the ball in the goal, see the ball go in the net. I'm I'm not underestimating, which is why every time that dude hits a shot, I'm like, <laughs> an angel gets his wings somewhere, even when it's against an undermanned team. Yeah, um, I, I have wavered on, <laughs> boy, have I wavered on my stance that Bogdanovich is going to continue is going to play minutes in the playoffs. Uh, I, I, there's a thing I just can't get around him. I think I want to see him with Randall. I want to see him with Randall. I think Randall, if they, I think they're, they, he will get good looks if he plays with Randall and they have some more spacing, um, around those two guys. Like, I think they'll be able to, 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 to do some damage, but yeah, it was he. You know, look, he's he's he doesn't forgotten how to play basketball, so maybe this helps him find what he lost when he came over here. And I shouldn't even say that because he's had moments here. He had I, 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 that. I know I didn't imagine that first game after the the All Star break against the Sixers where he was insane for a quarter, like making everything like that happened. So I don't think we've seen last the bogey. 
Deadward 604. Did Jared Allen poop his pants a little when he read Mitch was back tonight? I'll hang up and listen. Uh can I I'm gonna see I'm gonna I'm gonna turn a I'm gonna t- turn over a, a new I'm gonna have a different sing a different tune. Um the fact that like every NBA media person and obviously a lot of Nick fans have gone full tilt with like the Cavs want no part of the Knicks. This is now like a national media talking point. Like you hear Zach Lowe say it, you hear Brian Windhorst say it. And like, of course, like we get why they say it. We all watched the series last year. We watched, you know, games of those teams played this year. I am at the point where I'm like, let's, let's exercise a little bit of caution in terms of one. That's a really talented team over there. It's a shell of themselves without Donovan Mitchell to be very clear. And I do think Jared Allen is overrated. I've always thought he's pretty overrated. He's had the best year of his career this year, even better than the year he made the all-star team in my humble opinion. Um, I don't, I don't trust that guy in games when it gets nasty. All that being said, they still have a lot of talent. Their hurt is all hell right now. They don't have Struess in addition to not having Mitchell or or the immortal Dean Wade. Shout out Fred Katz. Uh, but I don't know, man. They have a lot of talent. And if they got to a point where they were just like. Everybody is like we are the joke of the league in this in this specific context in terms of people think that we don't stand a chance against this team. That's the sort of thing that could really fire a team up. That's the sort of thing that could really light a fire. And like, do we really need to light a fire under Donovan Mitchell's ass if he's back and healthy? Um, that's the only thing that's caused, giving me a little bit of pause at this point. Um, now, all that being said, we may not face the Cavs in the playoffs. So we'll see. By the way, uh, and again, shout out to our sponsor, T2 Social, T Squared Social. Um, go, go watch all your sporting events there, 42nd Street in New York City. Significant out of town score. A game went into overtime and probably shouldn't have gone into overtime because the Rockets were up by three late. The Houston Rockets have extended their winning streak to 10 games um, by beating the Oklahoma City Thunder in Oklahoma City tonight to remain, I believe, a half game back of the Golden State Warriors for 10th place in the West. This Warriors thing, or excuse me, this Rockets thing is wild. And just one of the wilder things I've ever seen watching this league. Very wild. You could have watched it at T-Squared Social if you wanted to. And you're out for a Wednesday night in New York City. Yeah. By the way, um, I appreciate the the brake pumping, the pumping of the brakes on the Cavs slander. No, you Do you want to know another entity that is saying that the Knicks have the Cavs number and the Cavs don't want to play the Knicks? Let me guess. Like a Cavs content creator? The Cavs. Yeah, the Cavs know that we have their number. The official podcast of the Cavs that like has people close to the team is like, oh, yeah, like they're cut. They're shook. Like you're the boogeyman. I know res- we're not in the position of being the boogeyman, but Knicks are five. You respect the opponent. It's almost like- fine. Respect the opponent. The opponent is terrified of their opponent. I Great. And I, Listen, I'm- I understand in pickup games with Scarlett Ray or Izzy, you would not go in being like, oh, this is over, right? You would take it seriously and you would res- expect respect the opponent and play 48 minutes and there would be rim protection and your daughters would be like, I, I, I can't, I can't beat daddy. He's just, he, he just never lets up. And it's, and it's a good mindset. Um, Listen, respectfully, daughter- in that analogy, yeah. The Knicks are you, and the Cavs are your daughters. Knicks and five. I I played my daughter in chess tonight. I took it very seriously, mm-hmm. I, and I beat her. And just like in a first round matchup against the Knicks, the Knicks would probably win that chess match against the Cavs as well. Again. Okay. Continuing. Uh, Al Boogie NYC up twenty four, and Brunson takes charge. Hashtag leader. I wrote it down. I noted I noted it was my first note from the third quarter because I by the by the second half, I kind of stopped taking notes in this game. Um, but I took note of that. Um, one of one. I love that other guys are getting attention. I love that Deuce Pride's getting attention. I love that Josh Hart has been getting his flowers. I love uh, David Chenzel has been getting his flowers. Uh, Chua now Mitch Hardenstein, all these guys getting their flowers. Great. Give them all the flowers in the world. 
This team is fucking nowhere without Jalen Brunson. And I'm happy that we got a comment in regards to him tonight. Isaiah Jackson, what's going on, man? Precious has been the greatest surprise. Yeah. Um, I didn't expect this. I, I grant that I had not watched him nearly as closely as I would have liked to. But I knew that there was tantalizing talent. But when you hear about a guy that like has flashes, to me, that connotates just like a very frustrating player. Because by, by definition, if they show flashes, then there are also a lot of periods of time where they're not showing flashes because otherwise they wouldn't be flashes. And I think we saw that when he first came here. I think we saw that where he would play these 8, 10, 12-minute stints and there would be like a play here or a play there. But like for the first month he was here, that dude was like a punching bag. But from the fan base in terms of like, oh, man, we got to deal with more precious two minutes. So great of him to turn it around. And, um, and it's it's a really good, good sight to see. Gee Hooper then coincidence that bogey looks better without Burks. I mean, I thought the ball moved better in those minutes without Alec. That's the thing is like Alex, like he's been a black hole. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Ultimately it's probably a coincidence, but maybe not. Thanks. You Sam L what's going on, Sam Hart has been the initiator in the non Brunson minutes. He has, he has, I still think deuce is doing a little bit more, you know, it may only be a, a couple of plays here and there, but I feel like the offense has been flowing better in those minutes. And he's he's obviously a part of that. Now, maybe, look, maybe it's just his spacing, and I'm perceiving it because of his spacing. But I want to see more. I want to see more of him, like, without... I, I love him with Brunson on the court. I want to see more of him without Brunson on the court, and I want to see it specifically... And I know the minutes did not go well in January, but I want to see it specifically with Julius Randle um, and see what we could do with that. And we'll go from there. David R. What's going on, David? Mitch's handle skills competition next year. That was so cool that he put it on the floor a few times tonight. That was great, especially that one uh, possession. I think you're talking about early on in the game. I mean, you know, he loves this stuff, but I don't, you know, um, Mitch is so fascinating, man. Like, what a what a wonderful player. What an easy guy to root for. He clearly has so much more that he wants to do, and yet he has thoroughly embraced his role here and done, especially the last few years, like everything they've asked, and then some. And um, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see. Will he continue truly to embrace being a backup center? And, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're going to have some interesting decisions to make this summer. And I, I think largely those decisions may be out of their hands, depending on what trade scenarios may develop. But um, I'm really happy Mitch is back. I'll say that. Robert W. Cross. Here it is. I'm curious what's on his mind tonight. First time, long time, it's your boy, John. I am not afraid of Boston. Let's brawl. 55% chance. Um, 55%. Let's freaking go, Knicks. Write the Tibbs book. Love ya. Hashtag 53 wins. I don't know what 55% is referring to. He gives us a 55% chance to win. A 55% chance to win. Well. Look, I'm just going to tell you the numbers. There have been, I did it with Andrew on the, the Patreon pod last week. There have been four. I don't know if the, if their net rating has gone down because they lost to the Hawks recently. I don't, I don't know if it's gone down by enough to drop them in the rankings of what I'm about to say. But as of last week, their average margin of victory was the fifth highest in NBA history. And the four teams that had a higher average margin of victory all went on to win the NBA championship. Um, 
and the other the rest of the top 10 were like legendary teams and i think two of them lost to two other teams in the top 10 the 16 spurs and i want to say the 72 bucks um you know and like yeah sometimes great teams lose the 73 win warriors did not win the championship there was quite a confluence of events that that caused that um, i'm not saying the celtics team is the 73 win warriors because they don't have steph curry or they don't have anyone on the level of steph curry um, Jason Tatum is an excellent player. I think I I trust my guy. I trust our guy, Brunson, more than I trust Tatum in the last five minutes of a close game. That's big because that means you just got to keep it close. Now, the problem is keeping it close because there are some nights with that Boston team where it doesn't matter what you do. They're just going to blow you out of the water because if certain of their guys are just making shots and it just you're, it doesn't Nothing you do matters. Um, we'll see. Hashtag Nixon five. There we go. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Uh, Robert W. Cross has one for the legend of GMAC. I may go fill up my cup of water and let Andrew answer this. I am eyeing a 50 person party bus for KFS and the Eastern Conference Finals. Should we get a bigger one? I'll let you know this. Uh, Robert. Not only do you not have to, because I didn't realize that they had buses that big at the Looney Bin where you reside, but um, we probably would just like ask them to fly you. I don't know if, if they allow straight jackets on an airplane, but fly you to New York for like a watch party at T Squared Social. Like we'd rather or like a, a victory party at T Squared Social where we could watch like. All the post game coverage, maybe even like the end, of, maybe we do like a game watch party there. Uh, so yeah, I will say we'll you could save the money on the on the bus and just join us at T Squared Social for said events. No need for a party bus. We have a part a watch party location that loves us very dearly. It's like a party bus except it has no wheels. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, next up, Giovanni Mistretta. Two things. Two things. First, welcome back, Mitch. Second, Precious Poster made Mensa break out into a song. I missed it. I wasn't watching the watch along. I was bad, a bad, uh, bad friend. You're you're fine. You're watching the game the way you watch it. Would you like to see said poster? Yes, I would. This game of the that, watch along. The Knicks causing Mensa to start an author call. That's incredible. Yes. Truly incredible. It's my new favorite thing. Um, Giovanni finishes. Love this team. Let's fucking go next. Um. Yeah, that was a nice poster. I got it. That's going to be a fun one. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Giovanni. Frank Miranda. Oh, we, we don't get to hear from him that much anymore. When we do, though, I, I don't, I don't, what is it? I don't, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, make it a Dos Equis. I actually don't care for Dos Equis, but. Okay. Frank Miranda, what's up, Mac? It's your boy, Frank, from Patreon. I've seen enough. It's officially time to give Tibbs his flowers. This coach can turn me into a functional <laughs> can turn me into a functional NBA rotation player. He's not getting enough praise. Pressing every right button. Um it's nice to see. Uh if the goal here was to get me to, to wax poetic about Tom Thibodeau. I mean, here, you know what? Can we use this as an excuse to do um a little advanced uh a little advanced stats update? I got it ready. Where do you think the Knicks are in net rating? Um, I looked at this earlier today. Um, I think they're still fifth. They are fifth. Five but did points. they move up from sixth? I think they were sixth before. They were the behind eight. the Nuggets. So the Nuggets are currently playing against the uh, Phoenix, Phoenix Suns, Suns and they are down by eight. There you the go. Quarter. And the Knicks are now fifth in net rating right behind the Pelicans who play the Milwaukee Bucks next. So. Yeah, and and well, hold on. We'll go back to that in a second. What are they in offense? And what are they in defense? Now tenth in offense and seventh in defense. They have a top well, ten that's... offense and a top ten defense. So that's obviously notable. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Tibbs is showing you, and I he show. I'm I'll, I'm going to follow up on this statement, but I will say at the outset he is showing you what he can do when you give him a team full of his types of players which i know in the eyes of many is a demerit 
because it's like, yeah, but he needs his types of guys. Well, to which I will push back and I will say, well, what what makes a Tibbs player? How are you a Tibbs guy? What do you have to do? You have to try your ass off at all times. You have to make shots. You have to be like a functional like player. And if you don't make shots at a consistent basis, you better do everything else really well. Um, Obviously, you got to defend your ass off or at least try really hard to overcome your physical limitations if you have any. Um, You have to be smart. I think that's an underrated part of being a Tibbs player. I think you have to be smart. And maybe the most important thing in his mind is it's not just being unselfish. It's about knowing the line, knowing the difference between like selfishness. Like, I I don't know. I'm not going to be able to phrase this, so I'll just give the example. Tate DiVincenzo, over the course of many games over the last two months, has put up 16, 17, 18. The other night, he put up 23s. So you might look at that on his face and be like, well, that that dude's jacking up a lot of shots. Maybe you should pass the ball a little bit more. No, those, the, that's those shots that he's getting are the best shots that they could get because he's a great shooter and that's not selfish. Is it, it's neither unselfish. Like it's not selfish. I'm not going to sit here and call it unselfish, but it is the proper basketball play. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to make the proper basketball play. Sometimes that is going to require you to jack. I mean, do some pride. Jacked it up. What was it? Seven or eight times in the first quarter tonight. It's because it was the proper basketball play. It was not being selfish. So Tibbs wants someone who people who understand the difference between all those sorts of things. And and to 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 anybody who, again, will levy a criticism of, well, he needs his guys. What fucking players do you want on your team other than the sorts of players that I just described? What, what, what are we doing here? You know, um, so I don't think that's a valid criticism. I do think he's a great coach. I do think he's perform- it's been an exceptional year because he has, again, a team full of these sorts of players. Do I think he's going to finish top three in coach of the year? At this point, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I would still probably skew no just because I, I got I would be shocked if Mosley's not in the top three. And I know the Thunder lost tonight. I, Maybe the Thunder really scuffled down the stretch, but again, Dagnall's been the favorite for the entire year. You're telling me he's going to go from favorite to out of the top three? So that's two spots. So you're telling me Tibbs is going to get it over Missoula? Maybe. Maybe. I don't... I doubt it, but maybe. And then the other guy, and I, I'm, I'm belaboring the point because Andrew brought it up before with the advanced stats check. Yeah, the Knicks are fifth in net rating. The team that's in fourth is the New Orleans Pelicans. And nobody talks. about. I I said this recently, and I'll say it again. Nobody talks about Willie Green and the job that he does with that team that has not had a point guard all year. And yes, they've lost some some games in the fourth quarter and and had and had have had some unfortunate scuffles at times. But man, they go out there. They play their asses off on defense. Um, Like. I think they make the right play whenever I watch them. It seems like they're like lots of passing the ball around, like trying to get their good shooters, and they have a lot of them, good looks from behind the arc. Like that team is as well oiled a machine as you could be without a real point guard. Um, and so I just think he also deserves consideration. And then, you know, there's another five or so guys, but yes, Tibbs should absolutely get his flowers 100%. Hajzu, Brunson 26-point game is just another Wednesday. I'm spoiled. We all are. The scoring average went down tonight. <laughs> you know? His scoring average went down tonight. Um, he's the head of the snake. It all happens because of him. Um, so, yes, thank you for giving him his flowers. And another one from Hajzu. What's the ceiling on Devo and Deuce? Feels like we're just scratching the surface with them. This team feels very, very scary when healthy. Um, I'll just, I mean, I'm going to tell you a stat or a couple stats over the last, uh, since OG Ananobi and Julius Randall went out, 
I know OG came back for three games, so I'll include those three games. The Knicks are four games over 500, and Dante DiVincenzo was averaging over 20 points. And if you take away the games that Brunson missed over that stretch of time, which I believe is two or three games, um, if you want to include the Cavs game in there, but I think you can bump them up another game or two above 500. So this is a team, and I'm not going to sit here and do the math right now, but like this is a team that, for all intents and purposes, Dante DiVincenzo has, not for all intents and purposes, Dante DiVincenzo has been the second offensive option on for going on, what's today? What's today? March 27th? Okay, so for two months, he's been the second offensive option. And they are on a pace for the full season. They would be on a, I don't know, would it be a 46, 45, 46, something like that win pace with him as the second offensive option. So you tell me, what what is that? What is that? What does that look like? What is that an all-star? Probably not an all-star. But it's like that next level down, isn't it? Um, I think that's a pretty good player. And then Deuce, I kind of talked about Deuce already. I, I think the ceiling on Deuce. I think I think the ceiling on Deuce, not, not to say that he can't start games for a good team. I think the goal for him should be like, I want to, I'm going to find myself in the running for six man of the year at some point in my career. To me, if I was Deuce with pride, that would be my goal. I'm going to be a guy who's going to, I get spot start, but like, I'm the first guy off the bench. I could come in for the point guard. I could come in for the two guard. I could come in for the freaking small forward. doesn't matter. And I'm going to play 30 minutes a night or 25, 30 minutes a night. And I'm going to change everything on defense. And I'm going to make shots and I'm going to do some other stuff too. So I think that's maybe the ceiling for Deuce. Colin Mal- Maluli, longtime listener, first time writer. Thank you for coming aboard. We appreciate you, Colin. Mitch will fit like a glove off the bench. This team is going to turn the garden into Rikers for the, for the way. Um, I like that. Uh, I've been to Rikers. It's not not the most not the most pleasant place in the world. So yeah, it, I I think op- opponents will feel the same way. Um, Mitch is fit with the backup unit. Look, I think it's kind of getting to what I talked to Fred about, like the backup unit. The, the concern with the backup unit is offense. That's the question. What, how are you solving it? That's How are you solving that problem? Hardenstein would solve it in one way or try to solve it, help solve it in one way by juicing, juicing the offense a little bit more with all the things that Hardenstein does. But then you're taking away minutes that he plays with Brunson. Okay. How does Mitch help solve it? Well, offensive rebounding, obviously. Great hopefully turning defense into offense. Um, you know, the, the spacing gets will get a little muck, mucked up depending on who else is out there. But in terms of like his fit with the other guys who are going to be out there, I I continue to think that Julius is going to play the non Brunson minutes. I think that's I think that's a day one thing that happens. So Julius and Mitch have had a lot of time together. They have a lot of shared court time, court experience. They, we know Julius likes passing to Mitch, probably to a fault. But I think those guys will work together fine. And then, you know, you surround him with shooting. And I think you'll be all right. I think you'll be all right. So we'll see. Is it, you know, is maybe is maybe Dante in those units? Or we might maybe we'll see McBride, Dante, and. Josh Hart, assuming everybody's back healthy, that's a possibility. Maybe we'll see Dante Bogey McBride when everybody's back healthy. And it's Julius and Mitch. I don't know. Well, that's again, Fred said it on the pod today. Tibbs keeps talking about I want to see two starters with the bench unit. So Dante and Julius. Bogey, McBride, Mitch. I think that dog will hunt. Let's see what happens. Zach Horowitz, what's going on, my man? Great to uh, great to hear from you. 
I usually just say stupid shit, but I have a question, John. How far does this team go if we get either Randall or OG back at close to 100%, but not the other? Then with this squad right here, they bad. So let's do it in two separate um, two separate components. I think I think if they get either one back and not the other, they're winning in the first round. Um, if they wind up facing Milwaukee in the second round. Man, that's a tough question. Which of those two guys gives them the better chance to beat the Bucks? I my gut is to man, no, that could be said. I my gut is to say OG Ananobi, and then as soon as I say OG Ananobi, I am like, but Julius has had like he had a great game against the Bucks earlier this year, but they no longer. Well, you'd love to have as many bodies as you can to throw at Giannis. And the thing with them is if you have Julius in there, that's another defender for them to pick on. So do we beat the Bucks without Julius but with OG? Man, I don't know about that. That's a tall fucking order to be able to score with that team with Brunson doing all that heavy lifting. I know what I just said about Dr. DiVincenzo and all the love we've been giving to McBride and everybody else. That's a, that's a bear. I would not, I don't think I would pick them to beat the Bucks if they just had OG. I would not pick them to beat the Bucks if they just had Randall. Um, and if it's Boston, yeah, I don't same, same answer. So I guess the long story short is if we just have one of them and not the other, I think we're getting out of the first round and I don't think we're getting out of the second round barring, Barring something unforeseen. Of the four options, Julius versus Boston, OG versus Boston, Julius versus Milwaukee, OG versus Milwaukee. I'd the the series I'd really want to see is is OG with OG versus Milwaukee. I'd want to see that series. That would be I think that'd be fun. Um don't know if we'd win. Uh, Robert W. Cross, give me Miami, Indiana, Philly, Orlando, Milwaukee, Boston, Cleveland. Ha ha, we up. Respect your opponent, Robert. Hashtag Nixon five. Got to respect the opponent at all times. They will. That's the good news. They respect every opponent. They respected this Raptors team. You know, that's why they kicked the shit out of them. Uh, Joel, the writer, can we still make the second round or conference finals without Julius Randle? Hashtag next tape. So I kind of just answered this. Um, I think it'll be incredibly challenging. I mean, look, let we could, since I got another question on it here, like, let's just go through. So let, I, I, by the way, I think Julius is coming back. I think Julius is coming back. And I think the only way that we don't have Julius for the second round. First of all, we need to get past the first round of the playoffs. I think the if we did that, I think the only way we wouldn't have Julius Randle for the second round of the playoffs is if he came back and he re-injured himself. And that's that was that was it. Um so let's but just for, let's for argument's sake, right? Because we're just we're having fun here, right? Although the thought of being without Julius Randle is, is not fun for me, but let's just play it out. So your your starting lineup is Brunson, DiVincenzo, Hart, OG, and Hartenstein. So right off the bat, whoever you're playing is gonna they're not gonna guard Hart at all. They will play twenty feet off of Josh Hart from opening jump of that series. So that's something you got to get around and game plan for. Is it just going to be, we're just going to let Josh shoot it. And if he's comfortable, he's going to fire it up or or maybe not let Josh shoot it. We're just going to kick it to Josh and trust that he's either putting it up and making enough, to, making enough to keep them honest or putting the ball on the floor and attacking the basket and doing damage that way. So that's a challenge, right? So right off the bat, you lose some spacing. You gain defense, gain a lot of defense, but you lose spacing. Um, and then your backups, you're doing McBride, 
uh, obviously Mitch and then it gets interesting because you're definitely playing an eighth man. It's either going to be bogey. You may play bogey and precious. Maybe only play one of those two. Um, if it's again, it's like this, this gets really dicey because if it's precious and you're pairing precious with Mitch again, I know they were fine tonight against this dog shit Raptors team. Um, that's like a, that's a lot of clogging. That's a lot of clog toilet down there on the, it's a lot of offensive rebounding, but it's a lot of clog toilet down there by the, by the rim. If it's bogey, then who do you, what are your two starters who you're playing with McBride and bogey and Mitch, presuming that's your Brunson rest minutes. Is it maybe McBride, DiVincenzo, bogey, OG, Mitch. Okay. Might work. So like they'll have some options. And like, I like the fact that in this alignment, if they want it to be, so they will never have less than three really pretty elite defenders on the floor at once. And they will certainly never have more than one bad defender on the floor at once. Um, you know, Brunson bogey shared minutes, notwithstanding. And I, and I, and I don't mean to call Brunson a bad defender, but he's, you know, he has limitations and he can be hunted. I mean, that's a really good team. That's a really good team, but I don't, man, it's a lot to ask for that group to go in and beat Yana, two two top 75 players ever, including one guy who's in the middle of his prime. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Juan Flores, what's going on, Juan? Was at the game. Awesome. Uh, Shouts to Canada. Hilarious seeing, um, uh, I'm assuming, oh, Bruce Brown stare back at Tibbs after hitting into his only three points. What a sight to see Mitch out there again. And that deuce first quarter had me levitating. Hashtag the third seed is ours. Um, yes, great to see Mitch out there. I feel pretty good about the third seed. Work left to do. There's work left to do. There's always work left to do. Especially with Donovan Mitchell coming back. But they're in a good spot right now. Um, getting that two-game lead on Orlando, I think, was was big. And Orlando has some some tough games uh, left, certainly. Um, the Bruce Brown staring back at Tibbs. That's uh, I wonder what that was about. Uh, because like I think Tibbs wanted Bruce Brown. I think he wanted to trade for him. Maybe it was a little bit of like, look at what you're missing. I don't know. I don't know. Kevin Danishevsky. In the spirit of a laugher, I have a general NBA question for you. Why do we not see guys rehab more in the G League before they come back to simulate game speed? Uh, I guess they feel like whatever they're doing in practice is sufficient enough. It's a great question. It's a great question. I don't... I don't know. I it, th my the easy answer is like if they're not doing the thing, it is because they do not feel the thing is necessary, and they do not feel the thing adds enough to warrant the trouble. Um, you know, and when guys come back who are of a certain stature, it's like they, but I get it. They do it in baseball, so that's your question. Like, why do they do it in baseball and not? I think it's different because in baseball, it's more like, you know. You can't really simulate live competition in 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 baseball, like with a with a with like whatever, whatever they however they practice in baseball. I think that what they do in NBA practice is maybe a little bit different. I don't know. I don't have a great answer for you. I'd be curious. To, I, that's a good question for Benji or DJ. Well, we'll ask Benji and DJ. I I think you just hit it. Which There's is what? scrimmages in in basketball practice yeah. you can get a look at how a guy looks probably at g league levels of pace in practice yeah whereas like it's why don't they like in football they have like inter-squad games and practice squads like yeah. for that very very reason 
Whereas baseball, it's mostly batting practice. It's mostly simulated games. So I think that's your answer. There you go. Thanks, Kev. Rafa, what's going on, Rafa? John, true first time, long time. It's great to hear from you, man. We're following KFS for years. Well, thank you for coming aboard and thank you for the contribution. Uh, great to see Mitch back and this team is special. Hoping that Julius Randle recovers well because this is a finals worthy team. I'll that's more that's more where I'm at. Forget talking about what is their ceiling without Julius. I want to see Julius back. I want to see Julius back. And I want to see them give either Milwaukee or Boston or both everything that those teams can handle because they are not going to be afraid. I think the best, the silver lining, and I'm obviously not the first person to say this, but the silver lining for the last two months is that all of these freaking guys that have had to step into bigger roles, literally everybody on the roster, including, by the way, Jalen Brunson, who has had to take on, I, the, the, I, he had, I think, the highest like usage rate in the league for a period of time when over the last two months, I think it's since went down, but like everybody's had to step into a bigger role and they have succeeded. Think about this. Well, they haven't all succeeded. Who have, who's fallen on, on their face? The two guys that got from Detroit, but guess what? We could, ha we are well on our way to envisioning playoff rotations that do not necessarily need to involve either of those guys. But you could also still give them more of a chance. So, like, I think that's a silver lining. This team is, they have self-confidence. They're not going to fear anybody. Um, the world coached, you know? Like, let's go give it a shot. And it's not like, and that's the other part. It's not like Boston and Milwaukee are not without flaws. I don't need to tell you about Milwaukee's flaws. They've been well documented. As for Boston, they were as great as they are. There was still that fear. Anytime they were in a close game in the fourth quarter, you know, five, six, seven minutes left, are they going to make the right decisions? So thanks, Rafa. Luke Stone, what's going on, Luke? Is Deuce getting any love for most improved player award? I feel like he deserves at least some consideration. Man, I think the Knicks got a couple of guys. I think DiVincenzo is probably the leader in the clubhouse on the on this roster. I think you can make a case for freaking Isaiah Hartenstein. But I'd probably put Deuce behind. I'd probably put Deuce behind DiVincenzo. The thing, the thing with these awards and why I think DiVincenzo would have the um the greater likelihood of of winning it is typically Typically, it's get a lot of the time it's given to a guy who makes a leap into all star status or will make make a leap from like a fringe all star into like a no doubt about it, like all NBA MVP vote getting caliber player. I think that's how John Morant won it the other year um, or recently that all that being said, you like sometimes a big stat jump is enough. And DiVincenzo. So last year, he averaged 9.4 points per game with the Warriors. This season, he's averaging 14.9 points per game for the Knicks. And his season average, get this, somehow is only one minute more that he's playing per game for the Knicks than he was with the Warriors. Um, he's averaging an additional, or he's actually averaging one less rebound because they're not asking him to rebound as much. One fewer assist, so those are both knocks. And then his effective field goal percentage is about the same. His effective field goal percentage last year was 57.4. His effective field goal percentage this year is 58.1. I still think of the two, he would have the better case than Deuce. But just for good measure, I will um, pull up Deuce's numbers. So Deuce last year, and this does not include tonight, so obviously this average will go up. Here's the problem. He averaged, yes, he averaged 3.5 points a game this year, last season. This year, going into tonight, it was only it was seven point four. After tonight, it'll I don't know probably be eight or close to eight. You're never going to see a most improved player award go to a guy who's averaging under ten points a game, and I think there is a significant chance that Deuce McBride is going unless he just I mean he's going to throw up twenty spots every night for the rest of the regular season. But even then, I just think you're not going to have the counting stats, and it's the sort of award where people are going to look and be like. 
how much did a guy really improve if, if he's averaging you know eight point something points per game? Unfair as it is, because that's the other part of it. And like we talked about this with the with with RJ Barrett's candidacy, because RJ started hot and it was like quite bad for twenty whatever games, and then has gotten better in Toronto. It's a full season award. So like the fact that Deuce was essentially out of the rotation for the first thirty whatever games or twenty whatever games, whatever it was, like that that's part of it. You have to consider that. So that's the tough part. Love life. Uh, can we make Jeremy dancing at the garden clip a thing every time the Knicks win from here on in? No. Thank you, Love Life, for the wonderful contribution. Uh, I like the photo you have. It looks like a cherry blossoms. Maybe yeah. some kind of orchid. Regardless, no. Thank you for the question. John, you're up. I like how you're giving no explanation. Sam Garcia's dad. Who needs a party bus? Mitch is back. Hashtag riding that D train. If you know, you know. Seriously, so happy to see Mitch back. Can we please start the playoffs already? Um, No, because we need to get our guys back healthy. So let's wait. Listen, um, Spurs won tonight, by the way. They have Wemby back. I'm assuming Wemby's going to play against us. Now, they had to go down to the final minute to beat a Jazz team that is, I mean, to, to say that the Jazz are currently tanking, is under understating what has been happening in Utah lately. I believe since the all-star break, not only do they have the worst um, defense in the league, but like the worst defense in the league by like five points per hundred possessions or something like that. Um, you know, all that being said, they have a little bit more work left to do. Um, so let's get our guys back. Let's keep racking up some wins. Let's secure that three seed. And uh, let's go from there. Jason M. Hi, Jason. Playoff bench will be Deuce, Devo, Hart, Randall, or OG, and Mitch. Deuce, Devo, Hart, Randall, OG, and Mitch. If I had to bet on it, yeah. I mean, I I'm I'm not I'm not I will die on on Bogey Island that to think that he may still factor in uh f- probably foolishly, but I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Alex, hello Alex. I'd pay to watch Deuce covering JB in a scrimmage. Uh, that would be a that'd be a fun little investment um, to make. So uh, yeah, sure, <laughs> why not? I'm sure those I'm sure those uh, scrimmages are fun. All right, we are done. This was fun, a fun win. Uh, a, they're all important. An important win. Great to have Mitch back. Great to have Deuce doing Deuce things. And great to be in third place in the freaking standings. I can't believe with all these freaking injuries what this team has accomplished. I appreciate it. Enjoy it. Relish it. This is a really special team. Whether they win a championship or make it to the conference finals or even you know whatever they do. this is a special team so i hope everybody's enjoying it and um read yes, the tweet Andrew, i just sent you read the tweet that you just sent me or the hey. x i just sent you no we, we call them tweets i saw this earlier bitch is really worried about the Knicks falling into the play-in with all these injuries it's me i'm bitches i'm also bitches um i was i was worried uh, we were all worried. And Many were worried. Be, yeah, we got to work on your cadence there, and and the delivery on that. It's it goes. Bitch is really worried about the Knicks falling into the play-in with these injuries. It's me. I'm bitches. I can't. I can't do the cool. The cool stuff. <laughs> my wheelhouse all right everybody uh don't forget leave this uh th- give a thumbs up to the video please keep subscribing to the channel we're over uh 
We're over 1,500. I hope. I hope nobody unsubscribed. No, uh, we're <laughs> almost at 15.1 now. So there you go. 15,001? Only... Oh, yeah, 15,100. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like 15,001. No, no, no. We're at like 15,005 oh, okay. yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah. better. Wonderful. Let's keep onwards and upwards. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, uh, leave a review, give a rating, the whole thing. And uh, we will see everybody. I will see everybody for the post game on um, uh, Friday. Will I not? Yes, you will. I will. Okay. Fantastic. So everybody, one on. more, one oh. more. Just read that. Giovanni Mastretta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now do Bernard Richardson. It's the same thing. Yeah. Hold on to the R. Yeah. Yeah. He did it. Have a good night, everybody.